Hi there, me again, your friendly neighborhood, humble stroke assaulter. Uh, so I'm going to do a video right now about how do I support someone that's had a stroke? You know, I've, I've uh, a couple of people have recently joined several of the Facebook groups I belong to who have a loved one who is currently in a hospital. They've just had a stroke. They're not all that communicative and whatnot. And they're wondering what can they do right and it's a fairly difficult question to answer um because right now if your loved one has just recently had a stroke i'll be honest even the doctors may not know completely what happened it can it can take 24 to 72 hours for all the decision making medically to be able to be made because they're waiting on tests and results and, and procedures and, and they're waiting to compare one image to another image, one test to another image. So it can take 24 to 72 hours in a hospital for them to come up with a complete clinical plan. Within the first 24 hours, definitely they should have a, a really good understanding of sort of how the stroke um, impacted you because you'll your physical presentation what part of the brain the stroke was in, what type of stroke, stroke was it ischemic, hemorrhagic, uh, was it a TIA, you know, exactly what was the um, the length and the breadth of your stroke. But then you're, you're left there wondering, well, what can I do, right? Um, well, there are basically four Ps to supporting someone that's had a stroke. Uh, one, be present, right? You're going to need to be there. Two, you're going to need to be patient, right? Uh, because this is now a fight not only to stay alive, uh, but also to regain where they were before the stroke. You know, then you're going to need to be um, to have, a, have a sense of perseverance, uh, if not assist them in you know, being persistent. And what I mean by that is, if you make a plan to step up to be counted, once you've made that promise, you can't cut and run. You're not like, yeah, I'll, I'll be there, and then it's going to get shitty. Because in the first couple, three weeks after the stroke, you know, I, and this was from my experience, I needed a whole bunch of help, right? And luckily, you know, my, my, my parents came up and, and helped out when they could. I had a really good bevy of friends up here that helped out. So... It's, it's a matter of, you're going to have to be present, you're going to have to be patient, and you're going to have to be able to persevere. The last one is pity. None. People that have had a stroke aren't looking for your pity, they're not looking for someone to feel sorry for them, right? So when they're having a shit day, and they come to you to tell you, my day's going shitty, and here's why, they're not looking for a pity party. Right? They're not looking for someone to pat them on the head and be patronizing and go, there, there, it's going to get better. Think about something as simple, and I've said this before, as tying your shoes. Something you learned when you were somewhere between the ages of four and seven. Right? Exactly what age you learned to tie your shoes, I, I don't know, but we'll say that's roughly when that might have occurred. All of a sudden... You're in your 20s, 30s, 40s, and you cannot tie your own shoes. Think about you can't put on socks without help. Right? So just, just think about that. You now cannot put on socks without help. Be it you don't have the mobility, like you've got paralysis, numbness, um, you've got some form of physical deficit or difficulty because of your stroke that makes it difficult, if not impossible, to put on socks. Or you have a proprioception issue where bending over basically means finding the floor really quickly um, or causing pain and discomfort, right? or whatever the case may be. Um, so, and that's what I mean when I when I would come to some people and they would like, oh, you're looking for a pity party, I'm like, you're a fucking useless human. Right? How do I ever trust you again? You know what? I don't think I should. 
yeah, never been looking for pity. Um, and, and neither are they, right? So when it comes to supporting someone that's going through a stroke, right, they're never looking for pity or, or a sense of, woe is me, my life sucks, so I want you to feel sorry for me. They're looking for someone that's willing to be patient, that's willing to be present, and willing to help them persevere. So, so you were, fifth P, you're going to need to be persistent at times. All right. So, some things about going through your stroke recovery. Let me just find the document. And again, I'm going to include the links um, for the documents I found, right? So that way, those of you that are going to help support your family member, your loved one, whatever you go, best friend, go through a stroke, right? One, let's just talk generalities. How can I help you? What do you need from me to make your life today easier, right? Do you need me to move some stuff around in your house? Like, if it's on a low counter cupboard, take it out from under the sink and put it on the counter. If it's in a high counter cupboard, take it out of there and move it lower. Put it on a countertop. Put it on a table. Whatever the case may be. Um, you know, because... Is it a case of, um, you know, I, I can't do stairs right now, so I'm going to be sleeping on a couch for the next two weeks. So you're going to need to help me with that. Is it a case of, you know, can you do my laundry for me? Can you, can you go grocery shopping for me? Another one, just accept the situation, right? Um, there is the immediacy of the stroke, and for the first five or six days, even though a person that's had the stroke hasn't really been able to completely accept the situation themselves. So they're in a bit of cognitive dissonance, right? I had a stroke. It can't be that bad. Oh, crap, it is that bad. No, it can't be that bad. Oh, yep, it is, right? Um, there are going to be times where, you know, you may want to point out, well, you should have watched what you ate. You Maybe you shouldn't have smoked. Maybe you should have taken care of your diabetes. Like Now is not the time to grab fingers and point. Now is not the time to go, well, you should have done this, and you could have done that. Well, had you done this, again, you're just going to be told, leave. Get out. Right? Like, I, I, I don't need this right now. You can just go away. And I'll call you when I'm ready to deal with your shit. Um, the best thing is, if, if someone going through a stroke... Um, contacts you, be it email, you know, be it text, phone call, whatever, right? And they ask, hey, can you help me? Right then and there, they're showing trust. I trust you enough. I believe in you enough. Can you lend me a hand? Because right now, I'm debilitated. Right? I, I genuinely need your help and you are going to help me and here's how I need you to help me right that, that, that's, a, that's a huge deal right just consider the last time you had the flu and you needed someone to go to the store for you right can you go to the store and just get me like a bottle of orange juice and 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 get me some some food and get me you know now Think about that period of time lasting a month or two. And then think about that period of time lasting at least two months, but it's not predictable. Some days I need that, some days I don't, right? So if someone that's had a stroke turns to you and says, can you help me? That means they trust you, right? There is kind of an expectation because they've asked you to, you're going to step up, right? Um... Now, does that mean every single time you're going to need to come running because they ring the little bell? No. It just means like, hey, right now, I really need a favor from you. Can you really help me out? I've been there where I've had to text a friend like, dude, I need help. Right? Some cases, just be with them. Just being present. Right? Be present. Be patient. Have perseverance slash persistence. Right? And no pity, right? So, just spend time with them. 
right? As I said in another video um, about being self-conscious after your stroke, just takes three people, three people, you and two other people, um, that may not necessarily be directly related to the stroke assaulter, to make and have a assistance or visitation plan just just by spending time with that person right and i realize it's not going to be very much fun right you're not going to get a lot done um but it's the fact that you've taken the time to spend time with someone that might be pretty much boring right then and there because they can't handle much you know like just going for a walk like let's go walk down by the beach or let's go get an ice cream or you know let's just go hang out like come on over we'll watch a movie as best we can you know you want to go out for lunch go grab a coffee like, that's some simple stuff now I'm going to include a heart and stroke Canada 15 things so first thing first thing off of this list that I think is the most important is many factors influence the stroke assaulters willingness willingness to get up off their knees and start fighting on their feet right now even if you can't walk I mean would you rather you know live on your knees or die on your feet right? which one so at some point you got to be willing to put on your belt kit grab your rucksack get on the start line and get prepared to be pre prepared to move right and, and if you're not willing to do that you're not willing to assault your stroke right? because this isn't about in my opinion surviving this isn't about you know being a victim this is about engaging your stroke, right, in close quarters, right? Ensuring that when you find an obstacle, you're going to breach it. You're going to clear the obstacle, you're going to look for new work, and you're going to find the objective and you're going to salt through it. Because the ultimate objective, the ultimate objective is to, and I realize there is no predictable timeline for when this may happen, to reincorporate your old normal with your new normal to the point where it's relatively seamless as, as much as, as possible. So many things are going to influence the patient's motivation, that, that individual's motivation to get up and assault through their stroke. And part of that deals directly with the attitudes and the deportment and the demeanor of those around them. Right? If you're going to walk in and go, well, you're not really doing much for yourself today, well, you're just going to have shit days. I can't even count the number of days that I spent in bed. Just physically exhausted, mentally drained, headache that was, you know, like a Cuban fusion jazz band playing constantly in my head, you know, and it wasn't even a good tune. So some gains during the recovery process may happen more quickly than others, right? Um, certain things may not recover or return to their ability sets as quickly as you may want it to. Guess what? Strokes are messy. We don't know what we don't know because strokes are messy. So what's going to happen is certain things may come back quickly. Certain things may not come back as quickly as you'd like. And then you can make backward steps, right? So you can hit a certain progress point and then you kind of step backwards, right? Um, be mindful that someone that's had a stroke might be a bit tipsy and might fall, right? Now, if they do happen to fall, immediately take care of them as they need to be, and you may need to consider getting them to a uh, medical facility, even if it's just your GP to check that out. Next, one that I think is probably the most important measuring progress right certain things are not going to look like they progress at all but when you 
when you compare it to what they're able to do a week ago versus two weeks ago versus three weeks ago versus four weeks ago versus eight weeks ago, right? When you look at it, at the amount of recovery, the amount of rehabilitation, the amount, the amount of, you know, redevelopment in their skills that they've developed over a longer period of time, sometimes it might not be um, the most advantageous to look over the last two weeks. You might need to look over the last two months to see that level of difference, right? And then with measuring that progress and seeing that difference, you need to celebrate the little successes of the person that's been going through the stroke. The biggest one is uh, that, that you can do that will directly impact how that progress happens is you need to monitor their behavior and their attitude, right? Because post-stroke anxiety, post-stroke depression, they're huge, they're, they're massive, right? Uh, and I've done videos on post-stroke anxiety and post-stroke depression. So if you need to find those, I'll include the links in, in the description below. Right? Because if they start to nosedive with the way they perceive themselves and the way they perceive their progress and the way they perceive the rehabilitation and fucking things aren't going right and I can't do anything right and, you know, I'm like a six-year-old again. and you know, That is natural. That's a normal thing after a stroke. Right, um, you're going to have to find a way to redirect them, right, and show them the progress that they've made. If you can't help turn them around, you're going to need to get them to a medical practitioner, and you're going to have to get them some help from post-stroke depression, right? And that's where you're going to need to learn to seek out support, right? And again, asking for help is not a sign of weakness. This is not a suffer and silence situation. This is where you need to reach out, find the resources that are the best for you, right? Um, or seek out resources and they say, hey, listen, I'm not the best avenue to help you, but this or this agency is, so you're going to need to talk to them, right? And then once you've found out what is available to you, right, and where that's available, you may need funding for it, so you may need to figure out who can pay for what, be that um, your employer, be that your employer's benefits that you get through your workplace, be that a government pension plan, be that Veterans Affairs, be that whatever the case may be. Um, and then when it comes to taking care of yourself, so you can only support the person going through their post-stroke journey if you're taking care of yourself. So I'm going to advocate that anyone that is assisting someone going through a post-stroke journey, um, go get counseling. Yeah, I just said that. Go get counseling. So if you are helping out on a day-in, day-in basis with someone that is going through their own post-stroke journey, please, it's going to do you a world of good uh, if you seek out counseling for yourself, simply because you are now going to encounter situations that you were never expecting in your world. Like these are things that you should have never had to deal with. Unfortunately, you are. So again, I'll include the documents and the links uh, for the research I've done on this, right? There's a, there's a few documents in there. But ultimately, if you are supporting someone that's going through their own post-stroke journey, again, you gotta be present, right? So you've agreed to show up, right? You've gotta be patient. Things are different now. It's gonna take time. Right? And some days it's not going to look easy. And some days they might take a half step back than where they were a day before. Right? And there is no predictability about this. So you're going to need to be patient. Right? You're going to have to help them persevere and you're going to have to help them be persistent. Right? And you're going to have to do that in a way that isn't demeaning or belittling or disrespectful because there are going to be days they are not going to know what they're going to need or want. And the last one, no fucking pity. I'm just going to say that again for those in the back that might have missed it. No fucking pity. No one that's had a stroke is looking for you to pity them or feel sorry for them, right? They just want you to be present, be patient, help them persevere, and be persistent, right? Not a time for pity. So I think we're going to call this the five P's of supporting someone. Um, you know, be present, be patient, be, help them persevere, be persistent with them, and no pity. So... 
On that note, if you happen to like what you've been watching over the last five and a half months, it's creeping up on my six-month uh, stroke anniversary. Um, please like, share, subscribe with your friends. Um, if you know someone that is helping support someone, please point this video out to them so they can get maybe some assistance they may need. Uh, if you want to email direct me, email me directly. You can do that at strokeassalter at gmail.com. I say again, strokeassalter at gmail.com. Or if there's a video you want to comment on, please leave a comment in any of the, any of the videos I have. There's about 115 of them or so. Um, and lastly, if you see either in yourself or someone around you, um, signs or symptoms of a stroke, and these are, these are relatively rapid onset, so things that just start magically changing quite quickly. Uh, things like they appear befuddled or confused. They don't know where they are. They don't know what's going on around them. Uh, people that have rapid vision problems. So suddenly there's something going on with your eyes. You see in grayscale, you can't see it in one eye. You can't move your eyes left. You can't move your eyes right. You can't move your eyes up. You can't move your eyes down. Um, you magically, you have facial droop, right? One of the classic signs of a stroke, facial droop. You uh, can't raise both arms equally effectively or at all. You can't smile equally effectively or at all. Uh, you're slurring your speech, you're stuttering your speech, you're using inappropriate word usage for situation or context. You have general body weakness, weakness on one side, inability to stand unaided. Please immediately place that person in a position of comfort and dial 911. Something so simple can save a life.